protests tonight. And within the past hour, arrests made down by the main public library on York Street, including the arrest of a well-known Kentucky lawmaker. This group of protesters did a lot of marching around the city tonight, and compared to last night, no major confrontations with police until the arrests started happening just a little while ago. WHAS 11 News has confirmed that Kentucky Representative Attica Scott of Louisville was arrested tonight, along with several other protesters in the parking lot of the First Unitarian Church right by the main library. Attica Scott has been a state rep since 2017 in the Kentucky House. It's not known the charges she faces, but a video tonight shows that she was arrested without any incident. And we have live team coverage here tonight of those protests and the continued reaction to the Attorney General's decision. Let's begin with Steve Jefferson. He's at 4th in York, where Attica Scott and the other protesters were arrested tonight. Steve? Yeah, dozens of uh, protesters were arrested here at 4th and York. Just a few minutes ago, dozens of police officers from the Louisville Metropolitan Police Department left this intersection you see here. This is where the command post was set up for those arrests because this is where the demonstrators actually stopped. They stopped here because they were told that the church here, First Unitarian, would be a safe haven for them. But we confirmed with church leaders that although they agreed to open up their doors for protesters, they were not anticipating such a large crowd. That led to a standoff between protesters and police here for a couple of hours. Now, take a look at some video. There were some tense moments here at York and Forth earlier tonight. One man ended up crossing police tape. He was arrested by Louisville police officers. He was taken into custody and taken away, uh, taken to jail in a transport wagon. The protesters, they stayed on church property. Officers, they kept their cool. They stayed in the street. They uh, were very organized. They were very um, tolerant of some of the things that was said to them from the protesters, from the church property. Now, we were trying to confirm if being on church property uh, kept them exempt from the curfew. The curfew started at 9 o'clock. There were several text messages sent out uh, over cell phones that the curfew will, would start at 9 o'clock. And that's when um, Metropol uh, Metropolitan Police Officers, they confirmed that they did make dozens of arrests for people who violated that 9 p.m. curfew. For the most part, everything stayed calm here at 4th and York. But again, it was a very busy night for both the protesters and for police. Back to you in the studio. Okay, Steve, thank you very much again. Steve's down by the main library. Now, Jesse Cohen of the night team has been following the protesters for several hours tonight. She talked with some of them before tonight's march. And Jesse, before the arrests were being made, you were telling me really no confrontations through most of the evening. Yeah, for most of the evening, Doug, and like Steve was talking about, that change when we were at that 4th and York location. But like you can see right now, protesters are on the move yet again, except it's very quiet right now. That's really the first time we are hearing a chant in quite some time. And let me tell you this, this group shrunk drastically. Earlier this night, we saw hundreds of people start out of Jefferson Square Park. They made their way towards Jefferson, and we saw them at that Hampton Inn where there was a little bit of conflict with what they are saying were three percenters. They turned around, went back to the square, and not too long after, they started marching with hundreds of people down to the Galt House, down on River Road, and back up here to that church. But earlier today, before all of this happened, I got a chance to speak to some of these protesters who have been here since the very beginning of this very emotional four months. Hear from them. Obviously, obviously I'm definitely shook up. Definitely, I wouldn't want to say scared because I'm not scared of any police officer at the end of the day because I've been to jail. I can go back to jail. It doesn't it doesn't bother me at all, but I'm definitely I'm definitely shook up for my people. For Brianna, yeah, it was worth for that. But any other just to be out here like that? No. Are you going to continue to fight and be out here on the streets? No. The way we do it right now, standing our grounds, letting the public, letting the world see us as we are. We're not trying to put on for anybody. We just want what is fair because the struggle goes on. It don't stop. And we're not going to give up just because they made that decision. We want justice. 
Well, Doug, like you heard from many of these people, and it's the same message that we have heard over and over since the very beginning. If they have no justice, there will be no peace. And with the decision yesterday, they do feel like there has been no justice. So as you can see, people are still on the streets here tonight. You know, that curfew at 9 p.m. is still in place, but it looks like they are making their way back inside of those barriers, inside of that police line from that 4th and York location. So for now, we're going to keep following this group to provide any sort of updates we can. But like you mentioned, I don't know where they're going to go, what the rest of the night will look like, but we'll be sure to let you know. All right, Jesse, thank you. Now we have more coverage all news in six here on the night team tonight. Attorneys for Brianna Taylor's family are calling uh, calling for others for Attorney General Daniel Cameron to release the grand jury's transcript. They want to know what evidence did Kentucky Attorney General Daniel Cameron present to that grand jury? Did he present any evidence on behalf of Breonna Taylor? Question tonight. Tyler Emery tonight interviewed a former Kentucky Attorney General who lives here in Louisville and a retired Louisville judge who advised grand juries. And Tyler, they also have questions. Yeah, Doug, they do. Daniel Cameron's announcement yesterday did reveal more details about what happened the night Brianna Taylor was killed. It also gave us insight into former Detective Hankinson's wanton endangerment charges. But these lawyers I spoke to and many others are still wondering what exactly was presented to the grand jury in secret behind closed doors. Many also wondering, can Cameron present any of that grand jury information to the public like the governor and others have called on him to do? In his announcement, Attorney General Daniel Cameron wouldn't be clear on one thing, what was discussed behind closed doors to the grand jury. Our team walked them through every uh, homicide offense uh, and also presented all of the information uh, that was available. Cameron specifically wouldn't say whether or not he or his prosecutors ever recommended any other charges for Brett Hankison or the other two officers involved. That tells me from my experience that no other charges were presented. Tony Stringer, former district court judge and legal advisor to the grand jury, says if other charges were presented, they would have been reported as true bill or no true bill. When you have charges that you want the grand jury to consider, you make recommendations as to whether or not you believe they should act one way or the other on those charges. Stringer and former Kentucky Attorney General Chris Gorman says grand juries most often listen to the prosecution's recommendations. You know, the old saying is, a grand jury can indict a ham sandwich if the prosecution wants to. That's the indication that the Attorney General got the result that the Attorney General wanted. Gorman says it's still possible Cameron's prosecutors did present other charges, but he says some information shared in secret with the grand jury can now be released to the public. You ought to reveal everything you can reveal without affecting the integrity of the grand jury process. Gorman says things like the FBI ballistics report don't need to stay secret. Also, the racial makeup of the grand jury. You don't have to reveal the names of the jurors in order to tell the public that three of them or four of them or two of them or none of them uh, were black. Gorman says the public and minority community should have the chance to see the facts of the case and know confidently the jury was racially representative. That undermines the confidence and the integrity of the system and that type of nonsense has to stop. So and how do you stop it? You stop it by being transparent. Cameron in his announcement yesterday did explicitly state he is not planning to release any more information to the public right now about the makeup of the grand jury or the reports that were presented to the grand jury. Live for the night team, I'm Tyler Emery. Tyler, thank you very much. Of course, that issue reported on being talked about nationally now. Well, three counts of wanton endangerment, those are the charges facing former LMPD Detective Brent Hankinson. That's what he'll face in connection to the shooting the night Brianna Taylor was killed. But the charges don't have anything to do with Brianna Taylor or her apartment. The night team Shea McAllister is back at that apartment complex with the story. Take a look inside apartment number three. Crime scene photos show the damage in the living room, a shattered side door, bullet holes through wall decor. Attorney General Daniel Cameron says it was former detective Brett Hankinson that shot into this apartment. One door down from Brianna Taylor, where two adults and a five year old were inside. It's still pretty raw because it's, it's really, well, I would say, what, six months ago. So it hasn't really been a little bit over six months, but, you know, it's still, uh, it was a traumatic experience for him. 
The attorney for the family who was inside when it happened filed a lawsuit against Hankinson and the two other officers who fired their weapons back in May, describing a total disregard for the value of human life. I mean, that's just probably no, nobody can imagine but when you actually have to go through it. Uh, it's an extremely stressful, intense situation. And when you have to still live in that space, it's, um, it, it's a constant reminder. The experience so traumatic, the attorney says the family had to move out of the complex. Now, the attorney says they're moving forward, calling the criminal charges a step in the right direction. The charges to, to them simply mean that justice is moving forward. Justice moving forward in two different courts, a civil court with the lawsuit and circuit court with criminal charges. Shay McAllister, WHAS 11 News.